you are newly arrived. There are some seats up here in front, I think, if I can see correctly in the dark. So for you who don't want to stand, there, is, there are seats uh, on the front rows, so don't be afraid. Uh, so welcome to this uh, final step of this day, uh, part of the Bridge Summit uh, 2019. Actually a concept that we are doing uh, during the year. So this is actually the Bridge interview number six, and we started uh, a little bit more than one year ago. And as I said this morning for you who was in the morning sessions, this is part of what we do during the Bridge Forum. We have our talks that are more inspirational and we get in information about new techniques or business models or uh, science or solutions. The Bridge interview, we have brought in a very skilled uh, journalist that actually could uh, ask the right questions to actually see uh, what kind of leadership and what kind of thoughts are needed for politicians, for uh, huge organizations and, and uh, business organizations and businesses to actually take the step, be a little bit more courage and actually make a difference in the world. Actually approaching and, and being part of the solutions to the great challenges we have ahead. <laughs> so uh, the sixth uh, uh, interview here, we are so happy to... Uh, 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 have uh, Helena Molin Valdes, uh, who is uh, head of uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, part of the uh, climate uh, of the UN Climate Secretariat in Paris. And I will leave the floor to uh, Thomas uh, shortly. I will just thank our sponsors again, making our interviews possible. Sigma, Swabak and Syd, and Agencia. So thank you for making this possible. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And for those of you who have been at a rock concert before, you know that if you have a big star coming up on stage, like Helena in a couple of minutes, you need to have this warm-up act before that. <laughs> so everyone is really engaged. And uh, Helena has actually checked the last interview we did uh, with Jessica Brodin uh, from IKEA, and she's a bit nervous that she has to play guitar by the end of the session, but I promise <laughs> that won't happen. <laughs> um, so, before we welcome Helena up on stage, uh, to give you some hands-on feeling on what this could uh, actually all be about, we have two persons in the room uh, that are doing a lot of interesting things, and we want them to have a minute each to share uh, what they're actually doing. So you see that this is, when we step into the UN zone, it's not just about high-level stuff, but it's also a lot of practical things going on. And so can I welcome Per and Arsenio uh, to the uh, upper stage, give them a warm hand. <laughs> and we start with, with uh, you, uh, Arsenio uh, Ida uh, Shaba Obaro. Uh, welcome back because you've been here before at the Bridge Summit. That's correct. Yeah. So for those who have not met you or did, uh, wasn't here that time when, when you uh, were part of the program. Uh, what is Mitimat? What, what are you doing? Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Mitimat is a social enterprise based in Nigeria and we work with water hyacinth, which is an invasive aquatic species. And interestingly, since we're talking about the UN and we have Helena here, uh, the United Nations Environment Program back in 2013 published a global emergency alert service uh, uh, report and it was about water hyacinth and the threat it posed to a number of countries. And as at the time they published this report, there were about 50 countries, both in tropical and subtropical zones, that were affected by the infestation of water hyacinth. What we're doing in Mitimeth is taking this environmental menace and actually transforming it into beneficial use. So what we're doing is we're creating lifestyle products with the water hyacinth and actually empowering communities that are affected by the infestation of the weeds. So we're transforming this menace and we're also creating enterprise simultaneously. Hello, uh, I'm from Emerging Cooking Solutions. Yes. What are you doing? We are, uh, we are replacing charcoal. We're, we're addressing the problem of death from uh, smoky and dangerous uh, cooking uh, conditions and deforestation by uh, making, we're introducing an alternative to charcoal. We pelletize biomass waste and we, 
we uh, sell uh, pellets and we sell clean burning cook stoves. And this is something I also know that Helena is actually personally engaged in and has been working with as well. And you just found out before here that you have at least spoken before. We've been on radio together without knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, this is what happens here at the Bridge Summit. You meet with people you were on the radio show before, right? right? Find them in the break then. Uh, so uh, as a sort of uh, cue over to, to Helena, uh, from your, both of your perspectives, what could we actually use the UN for? Are they helping you? You touched upon it in, in the, when you mentioned reporting at the end of it. Or, or is there something you would even like to reach out and say, Helena, this is actually a challenge we have that you or some of your colleagues could help us with? Would you like to start? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Pat. <laughs> You're such a gentle <laughs> All right, Helena, I think there's a lot that uh, needs to be done in terms of creating the awareness of the beneficial uses of water hyacinth and actually taking it to the next level. So for us right now, we're transforming it into handicrafts, so to speak. But I think there's a lot more that can be done with it in terms of creating new materials from it, like looking at composite fibers that can come out of using, utilizing this uh, um, environmental menace. But also looking at it from a two-fold standpoint, because you look at how this also ties into some of the uh, UN SDGs in terms of economic empowerment, uh, you know, creating a decent work, uh, reducing poverty. So it has a ripple effect uh, and positive social impact when you look at actually transforming this environmental waste into beneficial use. And I think the UN uh, can certainly support us in uh, what we're doing here in terms of supporting the work, uh, probably backing research in this area to see how we can go about uh, utilizing this and creating greater social impact in the communities that need it the most. Okay, if, uh, see if you can top that. <laughs> uh, I'll try. <laughs> no, I think I think what's uh, interesting when we try to do something that we, what we're doing in Zambia, it's uh, you start out because you see that there's an enormous problem. I mean, Zambia loses an area of about 300,000 hectares every year, which is about the same size as Gotland uh, in terms of forests disappearing, and uh, millions of people die from this problem. Uh, what, when you start out doing something like this, you have no idea what it actually entails. Uh, we wanted to make pellets, we wanted to make stoves and sell stoves and pellets. We turned out, what, the big problem is actually that you have to become a bank, because your, pro, your customers are very poor, so you have to offer them payment terms over a long time. Uh, over a long time. And when you, when you work with very poor customers, it's very, very hard to, to, to actually raise the capital you need to be able to provide those credits to your customers. Uh, so I think one of the big things that you can do is actually help with securities for bank loans, for example, uh, or, or, and also carbon credits, because you want to basically lower the threshold. And as an entrepreneur, it's very hard when you have to be the bank in every direction for your suppliers and for your customers. Mm -hmm. So this is really the big challenge, which I, I'd like you very much to highlight when you grow. Okay, Ajano Per, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, give them a warm hand. And... <laughs> And we welcome Helena up on the stage. Okay. And since you have studied uh, how we usually run these interviews, you also know uh, from the, what you saw from, from um, the interview with Jesper Brodin that we, we uh, are trying to do a mind map. We don't save the audience questions until the end if we have time. We'd rather try to, to pull some ideas from them from the very beginning. So I'm, I'm going to walk over here and with the help of you, uh, try to catch a few things. What you want to hear Helena talk about. I have prepared uh, a manuscript, of course. There are questions, so you, I mean, if you're like in school and someone is about to be elected to the Ornings Money Class or something like that, you don't need to be shy. There are other questions, but you have a lot of smart things to, to come up with, I'm sure. So we put Helena here in the center. And. Uh... No questions. Absolutely no questions. Okay. So I. I I start here with, uh, at some point, you will have to explain, uh, this is actually a challenge, yes, the Brudin had to explain the structure of IKEA <laughs> in, in drawing. 
I challenge you to do the same with the UN, uh, so we realize where you are actually based in the whole UN system. Okay. People sometimes tend to think that UN is just one big building in New York and one door, and you just ring on the bell and they fix everything. Mm -hmm. I've heard it's a bit more complex. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I also happens to know that you are, even though you were born in Gothenburg, you moved here fairly early and are connected to both Malmö and to this area. We want to hear something about that because I think that's actually where everything started. And now... The connections to business in this, I mean, uh, where are the solutions and how do you uh, get closer cooperation, which we are doing, trying to do today? Yeah? Talking about climate change. Climate change. When I did a tour of the U.S. last spring, I, I got a question uh, when I had a lecture for a university class. Uh, do you believe in climate change? But I, I guess that was not really what you meant. <laughs> yeah? Maybe the limits and the opportunities of the SDGs in general? The it's SDGs. Question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many, uh, Jasmine, how many hours did we have? Until tomorrow morning. We're not going to start until nine. The doors are closed and locked. <laughs> as long as my wife gets out so she can catch our daughter at kindergarten now, that's fine. Uh. Uh, schools. Lower education system. School. School. Education. Okay. One more. <coughs> yes? The number one outcome of the organization. What are you good for? <laughs> or why do you exist? <laughs> Which, or basically, I think we should maybe start with what, what do you do? No, I have, you have to have one more question. Okay. <laughs> what, 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 would, what do you miss? Mm -hmm. That's me. Hmm? Alice Cavio. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. We can fix that. Let's uh, get this started. So maybe we should, um, uh, to actually get everyone on board, uh, start with a question that, that ends up in, in the outcome. But I, what do you do? What do you do at work? What's your role and responsibilities, let's put it that way? Maybe because we are here at the bridge, uh, it's kind of a similar function. We try to create the platform for countries governments, but also non-governmental organizations and others, to come together to find solutions and most importantly to try to transform leadership and also solutions. And we do that through promoting regulations, laws, and also practices, which is mainly through practical work on the ground, as you heard this just before me here. Uh, from my, many of the private sector organizations. So what we do on a daily basis, how do we do that? So we have a, I work with the UN Environment Program, which is one of the many organizations that you referred to before under the UN. Uh, but we are a secretariat to something that's called the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which is a, a broad coalition owned by 65 countries now, or 60 plus countries. Um, Sweden was one of the founders together with the five others and now it's grown to 60 plus and we have another hundred or so international organizations, development banks and uh, NGOs, Stockholm Environment Institute for example is a member in talking about Swedish connections but many many other institutions, many of the city, big city networks in the world is members, Malmö has actually contributed something in that uh, regards. And what we do in this Climate and Clean Air Coalition is to work on reducing a number of specific pollutants. We call them short-lived climate pollutants because these are gases or particulate matters that contribute to global warming, climate change. And at the same time, uh, they are detrimental to health and it's refer they are also air pollutants. Right? So talking about reports. You mentioned a report that helped you in Nigeria to work on your subject. So UN Environment and the World Meteorological Organization produced an assessment report back in 2011-2012 on something called tropospheric ozone, which includes methane and black carbon. And these were 
guess is that the, the governments or the Convention on Climate Change really didn't focus any attention on. The black carbon is not at all included in the commitments from governments under the Kyoto Protocol. Now we have the Paris Agreement, 21 years after the Convention was established. We finally got an agreement in 2015. Uh, but black carbon is not a part of that. So, when this report came out, it generated a lot of interest because what the scientists uh, who wrote the report said, uh, based on a lot of modeling, very intelligent people looking at many, many studies, and they were saying that if the world was to take 16, 1, 6 specific measures, such as putting filters on diesel cars, uh, changing from open burning of wood to pellets, as you just mentioned, uh, and also some modifications on cooking and heating stoves, um, uh, avoiding leaking and venting from the oil and gas production systems, etc. 16. It would reduce uh, anthropogenic methane by 40% and black carbon emissions to 80%. And that's huge in the next 10 to 15 years. And that would has, have benefits such as less than, uh, more than 0 0.5 degrees avoided global warming. And for you who know about global warming, that's very much and very significant. Uh, and it would happen very quickly because these gases and particular matters are lived for a short time in the atmosphere, maybe weeks or days even from black carbon and tropospheric ozone to 12, 12 so years. And that would then uh, remove this agent from the atmosphere, which would have immediate impact on health on uh, other things such as uh, crop yields, because even the plants are hurt by ozone and other things. They stop growing, they have much less nutrition, and it's a big loss to, to society. But basically, in terms of crop yields, these scientists were calculating that by introducing these solutions and these particular measures through consistent action by governments, companies, and communities, we could save more than 50 million tons of basic crops every year. It's a lot, can feed a lot of people. And we would save more than two and a half million premature deaths per year, which is also a lot of people. And in addition to the more than half a degree avoided warming. So, so that's what we do. We try to make this happen. So, so <laughs> as a journalist, we're living on, on the conspiracy theories. Yeah. Is it right to say that while all the other government people were dealing with trying to come up with a climate agreement, some people realized if we sort of don't label it climate uh, that obvious, but talk about food, uh, early death that can be prevented, etc., etc., mm -hmm. it would be easier for many governments to sign that, and it happens to help the climate as well. That's a good theory, and mm -hmm. I think that's the right theory. Uh, if you listen to your former uh, minister, Elena Ek, who we actually had the benefit of being together yesterday, she was one of the founders, so it was Sweden, uh, Bangladesh, Ghana, Canada, uh, US, United States, and Mexico that, who, that came together in 2012. She was saying yesterday, she always tells this story that you know, we were getting together in the basement of the hotel where the, one of the climate meetings took place in Durban, and, and they tried to come up with some exciting things to do quickly because of what you said, there was a lot of delays in deciding on the famous Paris Agreement. That happened to be, it was supposed to be the Copenhagen Agreement, by the way, it didn't happen. And <laughs> so it was out of frustration and probably also out of what you said, some governments had difficulties to actually make it happen quickly. So at least it was a way for them to say, let's not wait, this is not about the, the willing, it's about the working, and there are things to be done now, and this is not controversial, it's something we can do together, and while doing, we build trust and we might come up with solutions uh, that lead us to a, a very strong climate agreement at the end, so yes, good thing. Uh, okay, check. Sometimes <laughs> our theories work, actually, <laughs> in the newsroom. So, uh, how did you end up there? That's also interesting. How did I end up there? Yeah, I'm an architect, by the way. How many architects do we have in the room? Yeah. One? No, uh, two? three hands three. at least. Okay. Huh? So, uh, I was working in a different field. Uh, I was working in, uh, also by coincidence, but I was working in something we used to call disaster risk reduction or resilience building uh, in the UN, in the United Nations. and. Uh, was working in a secretariat to an office of UN who was dealing with this issue. 
and had done that for a while. And uh, we had a similar kind of mandate to try to get others to do the work and try to uh, convince the governments and other stakeholders. And we have people here in Lund in this uh, re regional office here who has done a great job on resilience, for example, um, to, to work on these things. And I got a call from a colleague from the Swedish embassy in Nairobi because our headquarters of the United Nations Environment Program is in Nairobi. And there was somebody there at the embassy who knew me and who knew the, 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 the work that we were doing. And they said, there is this job, there is this coalition that Sweden was involved in, and they are looking for a director. Why don't you apply? And I had no idea that this existed, so I just looked it up and uh, looked interesting. So I applied, and then I was interviewed, and I got the job. <laughs> so, so, it was, so it was very kind of a coincidence. I would never have even known about it if it wasn't for that call. So you don't pick up the calls. <laughs> but then, uh, okay, and, and, and write those applications. Yeah, that's more important, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't have been, I mean, mm -hmm. if, if we go back to uh, you, when you started in Lund, yeah. there is actually a, a connection. Norman, normally you would maybe not expect an architect to, to be in that position in the UN. I think that's why you yeah. asked how many people. Yes. But, but for you, this is nothing that started with this job or the job before that. It started all when you were studying. Yeah, so uh, when we, uh, are you, do you come from Lund University, Lund? The architects, yeah. So I went to school in the 80s, from 80 to 86. And uh, one thing that was characteristic for the architect school in Lund at the time was that there was a, kind of a stream of projects that you can do in developing countries which attracted me a lot. Uh, plus, there was a lot of research going on. We talked about this before, on renewable energy and solar uh, housing and, and, and that kind of thing. So we're talking here, beginning of the 80s, uh, end of the 70s, actually. I arrived myself in the 80s, but that was what really attracted me, those two things. Uh, so we were, uh, in my career, part of my education and the degree, etc., was to work in developing countries in Central America. We worked in Nicaragua, and we also worked with a lot of other projects that the Lund, at the Lund at the time, at the architect school, there was something called the Lund LCHOS, uh, Lund Center for Habitat Studies. I understand now it's, it's a different uh, name. And they had a lot of projects going on on improved cook stoves, Maria Nyström, uh, other, other interesting things on, on building materials, etc. So this was all kind of my passion when I was a student. And that, of course, led us to other things and go, going out in the world working uh, in, on projects uh, as an architect, ready, for a few years. And then when me and my husband, who is also an architect from the same school, came back to Sweden in 91, there was no jobs for architects. Anyone remember the big <laughs> crisis in the construction industry in those days? So it was basically nothing to do here except looking for jobs outside the obvious and, uh, again, so, so an announcement for a job in Costa Rica to work in Latin America on disaster reduction. And among the long list of potential studies and backgrounds, it said architecture, architect. So, okay. I applied for that one. Again, I had the opportunity to do all these interviews and finally got the job. So we moved to Costa Rica and, and we never moved back. So this was 1992. So, I mean, if you compare the time mm -hmm. and, and the studies that were were they sort of a unique thing, uh, integrating what would today at least be labeled sustainability and uh, uh, effective resource management and all those fancy words? Or what was the climate, basically around even the climate issues? Time? Yeah, I think that at those in those days it wasn't a lot of discussions about climate. It was more the environment movement who was that too when Agenda 21 was adopted. It became sustainable development. It was environment cannot be seen in a in a vacuum, also it was environment, economic development, and social um, social aspects. So all these three together build a sustainable development. And this was in '92. When I was at university, this concept didn't exist still, right? Mm -hmm. So it was more about uh, looking at, uh, at, at you know we had the function functional kind of thinking in, the, in those days, and it was about uh, you know really solving the problems of a community and a city and looking at needs and also at the same time looking at energy efficiency, trying to avoid that uh, the forest were deforestated through better cooking and avoid health problems. It was not about climate, it was about health and those kind of things. And now I think we all agree that we, we think it's obvious that all of these things are interconnected, but still in many places and in many, I, I'm sure you're used to that as well where you work, 
people tend to, to stick to the one thing that they work on and have difficulty seeing outside the box. So back to work today then, because it, it's about bringing the different actors together. I mean, one of the questions we, we got was also about how to bring mm -hmm. businesses into mm -hmm. this. How do you practically do the work? Mm -hmm. So we do it, uh, if I go back now to UN Environment and the UN Environment Program and how the UN is trying to get businesses to also work in a sustainable way, there are many ways. So one, one way it, for businesses to get involved, as they say themselves, is that they level the field, which means that they actually want better regulations and better standards because then they know what the playing field look like and they can actually really focus on and achieving something uh, towards that goal. So if, if today the regulation says you have to do this kind of fuels or this kind of quality and they put all their investments in that and then a few years later, oh, that's bad, you have to do this other thing, then the production line becomes very disrupted and, and it doesn't really work as a business model, right? So having clear goals and standards and setting them at a globe and that's where the UN can help because UN can help bring countries together and achieve certain standards at the common at the common level. But also many of these things evolve over time very quickly, so what was good today might be bad tomorrow. So again, by bringing in some of these businesses and the production lines and those that knows about the processes from the beginning, it's also helpful when you negotiate what might be a right level of standard. So not for the businesses to run their own standards, but for the businesses to be involved and governments discuss what's possible and what we need to have for the well-being of the of the planet. And, and, and one example that was good just a few years back was actually to switch to diesel cars in Europe. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly they are about to ban, be banned, be banned mm -hmm. just a few years after you got actually <laughs> uh, environmental credits, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how would a business be able to react to those quick shifts in, in policy and government regulations? I think that's what business do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what the example you mentioned is a typical example also when you work in silos and you don't look at all the implications of, of, of one solution. So you have to be able to, um, because the matter of fact, diesel, burning diesel in combustion cars is cleaner in the context of less CO2 emissions. So if you only focus on I want to have less CO2 emissions, then diesel is better than gasoline. But if you look at emissions of all, all pollutants, including <coughs> NOx and uh, monobioxide, mm -hmm. other things that are very harmful for health and for other purposes, diesel is much worse than gasoline. And what happened when these policies were made, it was so focused on climate only, and uh, therefore you know, we are where we are right now. And uh, the same with some of the bio, biofuels, you know, when, you, when it came up in a big way and when food started to be turned into biofuels uh, for those that had more economic power, of course it's a problem because if you take food from people who need to eat and turn it into fuels that rich people can use when they exceed in their uh, energy consumption, of course you have a problem. So you have to just look at all, it doesn't mean that biofuels are bad, but it's just you have to like look at where it comes from, how it's, how it's, how it's uh, grown, etc. And the diesel issue, for Europe in particular, it has become a very red flag that I think that governments will think very hard before they take a decision based on one analysis. So mul multiple integrated assessments of what's good, life cycle kind of analysis before you make a bigger uh, political decision. I think that's that's the big learning. And this is what the UN actually not, is promoting very strongly. Which brings us very natural to the, the question about the sustainable development goals, about the opportunities and limitations. How do you, I mean, they are nice, they are nice logos created by a, a Swedish uh, design agency, uh, but how do you actually make use of them in, in your daily work? Or do you yes, do? yes, I think this is extremely important. I mentioned Agenda 21 before, that was 1992. Then, uh, which was very important as a first step, people started to really look at things in a different way, and, and uh, if you work in municipalities or governments, you, Agenda 21 was something that was often used as a blueprint for what could be achieved. Then we had, at the end of the millennium, in 2000, or beginning of the millennium maybe, the, the, the governments adopted a new framework that was called the Millennium Declaration, which created uh, UN, took that declaration from governments. Just to say a few words about the UN, by the way. United Nations, as you all know, 
from the name, is 193 governments, nation states actually, under one umbrella. So it's kind of a supra government. It's like, you remember how difficult it was to get the government in this country? <laughs> Can you imagine 193 governments agreeing on many things? They, there's no elections in the same way as you have in one country, but there are, is a lot of concessions that have to be made. And the UN, United Nations is the place where this, it's run by 193 governments. That's, that's the United Nations. Then the United Nations, the government-led body, which means it meets in General Assembly and has many commissions and, and, and different forums where governments meet, they need a secretariat because they can't like, function without somebody who takes care of running the, the daily basis. So there is a UN secretariat which is led by a secretary general, which is elected by the governments. Now it's uh, Guterres, he's from, you know him, he's Antonio Guterres, he was the uh, Prime Minister of Portugal some years back. Um, so the Secretary General is the head, he's elected by the member states, the 193. Then there is the UN Secretariat, which surveys all these decisions that governments take in their assembly. And that Secretariat has many different offices on humanitarian affairs, on development uh, and economic uh, affairs. Uh, and on environment. So our environment, UN environment program is under that secretariat. We are part of the secretariat servicing the governments and the decisions that governments take. But we also have like a quality, con we, are, we are not only executing what the governments tell us, we also are asked by governments to develop and help them set standards and uh, foresights and do analysis. And in some other cases, not so much in UN environment, but it's also uh, to provide technical assistance to developing country mostly and to, and to provide that framework uh, that makes it easier to take decisions. But then, that's the secretary, but then there's a lot of programs and agencies and organizations that are doing like, like you know, you have the EBL, I was just talking to somebody here from it, like an institute you know, who deals with certain things. You have the United Nations Development Program who does development, you have uh, UNICEF, who is a fund, it's a fund working for children's uh, well-being. You have the World Health Organization run by all the ministries of health. They have their own assembly. It's run by all the ministries of health. And they, they set standards, etc., <laughs> etc. Et there are, if not 100, close to 100 of those different organizations. Setting standards, providing legal, uh, you know, normative work, but also assistance and technical work. But all governed by the states. So, so it's like so negotiation it's, with yeah. not eight parties in, in Parliament, but 193 exactly. parties that should have a sign a secret paper and... <laughs> That's why it took 21 years to get the Paris Agreement. <laughs> no, four months in Sweden, 21, I think it, it matches uh, fairly well. But in the meantime, uh, 21 years seems like a long time. It is a long time. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, there is a lot of things happening. So then the governments or the member states have all these organizations to help them uh, you know, advance on agendas while they get their acts together and actually decide exactly what they are committing to. So, and this is where this coalition I work in come in. But th then talking about sustainable development goals, I think that was the question actually. Yeah, before we drag <laughs> you back into that question, yeah. actually, how do you measure success then in your part of this big, yeah. big world? So my, my personal part is the Secretariat of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. So we measure success in, let's say, maybe three ways. One, we want to be able to um, measure, like really be able to see that we have reduced emissions. So we are trying to, to look at real emission reductions by proxies, no? And, and secondly, we do that in 11 sectors that we work on, with transport, household energy, oil and gas production, etc., bricks, uh, brick kilns, etc. There are 11 initiatives, and we have certain indicators to help them. And they are linked also to the, now to the Sustainable Development Goals, which were also adopted in 2015, same, same year as the Paris Agreement. So on some of these areas, it's not only about climate, as you said before, it's also about better health and energy, affordable energy, etc. So, and then the third, the third uh, level of success in our coalition is when all our members, I said we have 130 plus uh, members, uh, roughly half our governments, and the level of success that we can claim is when all of them back home in their own institutions actually implement all these recommendations that are being uh, talked about. So that's, that's the ultimate, that's <laughs> level, the ultimate le level of success. So then, the SDGs, okay, in so the morning, do you, do you wake up and check what you succeeded 
If How many goals you take yesterday? Or in theory, that's what we should do. So we should uh, we should do that. And you know, those people who deal with those goals every day, they think that the whole world is crystal clear on the fact that we have 17 sustainable development goals that all of us know everything about, and we have 100 and what is it, 43 indicators or something that actually demonstrate how well we are performing against these goals. Of course, that's not true. People don't really know so much about them in detail, except what is good is that these goals uh, has taken, if we go back again to the 1992 Agenda 21, the Millennium Goals, it's all kind of building up. So those that work in development have, have, have uh, you know, traveled that journey. And the difference from those days is that the Sustainable Development Goals, which took another couple of years the, to negotiate is universal. So all governments, 193 member states of the United Nations have decided together that these are the common goals. And they have also decided together that these are the 100 and plus so many indicators because we are able to measure those things. And this is pretty unique. And it's, a, it's decided in the General Assembly, it's adopted by General Assembly, and there is a lot of different commissions by member states and agencies of UN monitoring these different goals. And that is completely unique in the UN system because before we have always been dividing the world up in industrial country, industrialized country. And yesterday we were in Bakotra and took a picture of the Security Council meeting in 1960, I think it was. There was a very beautiful black and white picture where you had the dog Hammerfoot sitting, chairing the meeting. I have it in my phone that I forgot it. I don't have it, so I can't show it. Uh, 100% white male men in this Security Council, all from, well, it must have been a Chinese, but he, I didn't see him. <laughs> Only white men and a, a few secretaries in the middle taking notes, no? So if you think of that concept in 1960, and we are very proud of Dr. Hammerfeld, obviously, but I mean, this was the concept. This was like, the, these were running the world. This is no longer the case. We have a much more integrated world where everybody, or the, participating in taking decisions in a different way now. And the Sustainable Development Goals is kind of the culprit of that because it's for everyone. And, and, the, and the indicators are for everyone to report against. Before, for the Millennium Goals, Millennium Development Goals was only for developing countries. It was for the industrial countries, or the rich countries to tell the poor countries how they should be measured and for them, for the rich countries to help the poor countries to achieve those goals. Now we have 17 goals equal for all, and of course we still help each other, but it's much more of an integrated way of collaboration. I think that's hugely different from before, and it makes all of us, and I think Sweden is not an exception at all in that, we, when governments or institutions set their own objectives, <laughs> they actually check back and uh, how does it fit, is there an indicator, how do I, what's the metrics, how can I contribute, and, and it's reported on globally, and there is a lot of analysis at universities and other smart people doing analysis around this, and I personally think that it will help us integrate and do less of this pipe, pipeline work because you can't achieve climate action and, and, and reduce global warming without also thinking about affordable energy and, and clean energy or clean industrial and innovative processes or gender considerations. I mean, everything, has, everything is connected, no? And you have a, there is this global framework, and if you haven't read it, I, I can recommend the reading because it's very much, it took couple of years, I think it took almost five years to get to where we were, but very intense work by thousands of thousands of thousands of people from all countries and all agencies. So it's, it's not a simple thing. It looks very simple in those nice, uh, I didn't know it was a Swedish designer, but it's very nicely designed. <laughs> and it looks simple, but what's behind is very well thought and, and absolutely something that will help us drive change. There are more Swedish connections here too. And we were about to be sidetracked, but, but actually the designer, two weeks before the General Assembly was about to adopt them, he was like, I'm done with this, I'm going on vacation. So he went away and left them at the desk at his New York office. And when he came back, someone had changed one of the goals and put in strong institutions. And he was like, what? What happened? That's too long, it's too complicated, it's not what... And, and then his US colleague said, well, there was this guy, Jan, calling from UN. Uh, Jan Eliasson had called and said, I demand it says strong institutions on goal 16, I think it is. So that's also how UN can summon be <laughs> micromanaging even logo that's development, uh, that's if you didn't know that. That's completely true. Um, so, talking about the limitations, though, then, of, of the SD, do you think that we will reach all the... 
17 goals? I think there was a quote yesterday as well. I, I actually read the Doc Hammerfeld's, now I don't remember that neither exactly, but something, he said something like, uh, if you look too much on the ground you, and don't see the horizon, you won't get anywhere. And I think that's more, like, it was like the more eloquent, but that's, <laughs> you have to look away. You, know, you have to really have a vision and, and be bold and, and, and dream about change. Uh, Astrid Lindgren, somebody else was quoting Astrid Lindgren before, I think it's the same. You have to dream, you have to, you have, to have vision, and I think the SDGs obviously have, before, i give you an example, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals uh, said we are going to have hunger, we are going to have poverty. And then you said, why, what about the other half? Why would you just have hunger? Do you want half of the population to still be hungry? Is that the vision? I mean, you know, your vision is no hunger. You know, food for all, health for all, that's the vision. How do you get there? That's your problem as a government, as an institute, but you have to have the vision of like a, a very strong outcome. And we might not get there by 2030, which is the objective, but if you don't push the envelope and say this, we want no hunger. What do we need to do to get there? What's the role of the companies? What's the role, how do you cook food? You know, how do you, how do you keep the forest alive? How do you help the farmers to not burn? We talked about this before, uh, India open burning, one of these little groups. I mean, there are so many things you can do, and the vision needs to be bold. So I think, yes, maybe we won't get there, or probably we won't get there, but we have to want to get there. And it, it's almost impossible still to, I mean, we have gone for 47 minutes without mentioning Trump, but it's <laughs> in these uh, days hard to, to completely uh, talk about these uh, issues without going to, and you also now see what's happening in Brazil, they you know, in, in, in the forest again, etc. So, when you look at the future and keeping the eye on the horizon, uh, what's actually happening among these 193 states negotiating in the, in the UN? So you have the 193 member states, which is the government of the world in the United Nations, but then of course you have some national governments, you have cities, you have regions, you have a lot of stakeholders, civil society as a big kind of concept of everybody else. And now, and this is also thanks to uh, the Rio conference, uh, the Earth Summit in 92, where for the first time the civil society, non-governmental entities were allowed in the conversation. This was after 1960, that picture we saw yesterday. Uh, and I think that was a big step to, to, to and I, since then there was uh, Kofi Annan who has now passed away, he was uh, Secretary General a few gener uh, two generations back and he, his vision was, okay, civil society is good, we need business. So he created something called the Global Compact which invited, and it was adopted by member states, so it's not against the will of the countries that the businesses that would sign up to certain sustainability principles would be able to join this global compact and be kind of certified in a way or the other uh, as parties to the conversation about sustainability. So it's kind of bringing in them, them in, in in a way that helps push the envelope. And the fact that you have businesses and NGOs and scientists for that matter in the same room as the decision makers, it's like this room where you have many different uh, entities coming from different parties, you get much more uh, informed decisions. So even though the governments will go away and take decisions, by having being in the same room, a lot of the ideas is being brought into that. And that goes to Trump. So Trump is like the head of state of a very big and powerful nation, obviously. But that nation is full of states and cities, and it also has some very smart people and good institutions that continue the conversation about the issues that uh, we have subscribed to all of us. So people, you know, the Trumps come and go and the important part is that we, <laughs> there are like a legacy and that, that there are decisions that are being taken at the global scale that others can adhere to and like move forward. So I'm not that worried. I mean, we should be worried. It's not that, but I, it's not the end of the world, I think. Okay. <laughs> say, so in our coalition, California, for example, is a, co it's a member in addition to the United States as a, as a government, and we work very heavily with California, and we work very much with a lot of the universities and other, lots of NGOs with bases in the U.S. So. Good. Uh, we also got a question about education. Whoever came up with could you just specify a bit more? What exactly? Yes. Uh, well, yeah. now I just want to hear uh, where we 
you think about young people? I love young people. I have three. I have three young people of my own. Which they are not, not so young anymore. But I mean, I totally agree with you. It's like the young generation, and you have Greta in Sweden. Greta Thunberg she is uh, a, a voice. Uh, we we work we work in my organization. We work a lot with uh, what is it called again? Now I forgot the name. It's uh, some people youth for climate change or something. It's a move, big movement. With, uh, with climate ambassadors from, from school, from maybe not so young as Greta, I think it's more like, a, um, like high school up. But it, I think it's extremely important, and, and education comes through different means. One is, of course, the formal curricula and, and how you integrate into the educational system the values of sustainability and the values of, uh, of sustainable consumption and production, the value of uh, uh, now climate change, of course, is very high on the agenda and what, what it entails. Uh, so that's the formal system, and then you also have like the more informal education system where young people can be involved, uh, and and and, um, and I think has an extremely important role. For example, we, we have one of one of the areas where we work very much is on waste management of uh, waste, because as you know, uh, uh, waste uh, rottening uh, waste or whatever it's, uh, uh, biodegradable waste is a big source of greenhouse gases, uh, methane in particular or you burn waste, and if it's not burned properly, it's also creating a lot of other pollution. So by reducing the waste uh, mountain, so to say, by better consumption, and also regulating some of these big uh, production lines where you create so much unnecessary waste, that's something that we in the UN can, can work on. But how you actually create a change of attitude and, and behavior change, it's never going to happen if you don't work with the young generation. And that's what's so uh, obvious when it comes to how you deal with uh, recycling, for example. I'm staying with my elderly parents, they live here in Malmö, and I can't get into the house without going just, you know, shutting down all the lights. They have every lamp in the house is always on, right? I don't know, it, I don't know where it comes from, but it's still like that. But if you go, young people will never do that. Children, I mean, it's children have to educate their parents, I think, when it comes to behavior change. So yes, to work with them. When we have tried to introduce, uh, from an environment side, um, curricular change in schools, what happens is, in developing countries in particular, where there is a lot of problems with educational programs, they are very worried about it because they, they focus on learning how to read, how to, how to write, the, the basic mathematics. And in the beginning, uh, like two, years, two decades ago, they did not want to touch the curricula on sustainability issues because they said it's derailing from that important part. Now, today, in UNESCO, which is the United Nations Education, Science and Culture Organization, there is a whole division about sustainable development, uh, sustainable development education. So it's getting, I mean, the switch also from the formal system is there. And, and still, some people get very provoked, especially by, by Greta Thunberg. She seems to be as provocative mm -hmm. as if you tell someone to stop uh, flying airplanes or something, you can put them, that's mm -hmm. triggering things on, on Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, even a former Swedish minister uh, posted something on Facebook, I want to talk to grown up people that has experience mm -hmm. uh, when she had been giving a, a talk. So, because going back to when you studied, you were kind of a rebel in a way as well, mm -hmm. and, and uh, belonging to mm -hmm. sort of a minority group actually caring about these issues. Mm -hmm. How do you stay on track? What's your, as a closing remark, sort of, what, what's your best advice to not just give up and uh, I don't give a shit because anyone else doesn't? Then? I think you should just keep, keep being provocative. I mean, you need, provo provoca you need to be provoked to actually do something about it. You can like it or not, but you need people to speak up. Yesterday somebody was saying that you need two to four percent, two to four people out of a hundred, two to four percent of, of game changers. <laughs> That's true. I mean, you don't need the hundred to start with. You need like a few, and and if they are young or not so young, I think that might. And you also need leaders, of course. And may, often they are not that young. But the good thing with young people is that you are not afraid. I mean, you 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 say what you think, and you 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 feel for. You have a much more of a passionate way for the future. When you get older, like me or some other people in the room, maybe we feel that we have done. I mean, you get tired as well. I mean, you can. So so I. I would say, go for it, don't worry too much about uh, those that uh, want to talk to elderly and more experienced people. I think sometimes experience is clouding the, the vision, so experience is necessary, obviously, and knowledge is uh, necessary, and that comes with time and with 
but you need to push the envelope, you need to be bold and you need to dare. And if you're young, you have your whole life in front of you where you can actually try to make it happen. So I would definitely applaud more of Greta. And I think with social media now that she has become such a media person, I think she's creating a lot of other youth groups to wanting to do the same and, and, and repeat it. So it's incredibly powerful. And applause for Greta. <laughs> And, and for you, Helena, thank you so much for, for coming here, for sharing what you do at work, yeah, and also the quick uh, uh, crash course in the UN system, how it works. <laughs> You're probably now on the sort of level that one or two percent most informed in Sweden uh, about the UN system. Uh, so give a warm hand to our guest. And as uh, earlier today, we hand over a small gift. It's a, a solar lamp to a, need, a family that is in need to actually could be a help for them to educate and be one of the uh, solutions to all the problems that we have. And so. thank you for inviting me to this forum. And I want to see if we can do something more together to bring the UN to the bridge, maybe. Why not? Mm -hmm. And more, exactly. more countries. That's what we want to hear. Right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. So what's happening now, for you who have registered for the dinner, the future dinner, is going to start in Lokal Kutton, just beside here, outside at uh, 5.30. And for you who are coming back tomorrow, we are starting the registration at 9 again with some coffee and, and some uh, snacks. And then we're going to start a program at 9.30 tomorrow morning. So 9.30 uh, here, when we start the day with uh, actually getting a, a recap of the results from all the markets that we have been working on. So we can actually see true solutions or at least uh, potential uh, solutions to those uh, challenges that we are facing. And then we're going to have great speeches tomorrow as well and we're going to end around lunch. So I hope you, I see you either tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, thank you for today.